How many of you still have power? All right. Any of you that don't have power? Still a couple of you? Okay. Just We will be praying for that too. Hey, I don't know if it, this has ever happened to you, but it's happened to me a few times. In fact, it happened uh, 4th of July. We were out at a, some friend's house. We're all sitting around, you know, staying a, away from each other like we're supposed to. But we're all talking and visiting. And uh, we're kind of telling stories like guys do. I was sitting with the guys. Joy's over sitting with the ladies. And, and I started telling this story. And while I'm telling the story, uh, I'm looking at one guy over here and talking to a group of them. Well, somebody, one of the ladies walks over and starts talking to the guy that I was talking to. Which, first of all, I thought that was rude that she just kind of interrupted him like that or interrupted me. So he answers her questions. I kind of stopped for a minute. He turns back around. I continue on in my story. And then uh, after I talked a little bit, one of the other ladies came over and started talking to another guy. So I just decided I'm just going to look at this guy over here and just finish my story. Well, as I'm talking to him, he turns around and starts talking to somebody else. And I'm standing there just kind of talking by myself to myself. Now, has that ever happened to any of you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good, because I, I thought maybe it's just that I'm so boring that people just kind of ignore me. <laughs> but anyway, as I was writing this lesson this week, it, I thought, you know, there's probably a lesson in there for me. Because I don't like it when I'm talking to people and they're not listening to me. But the reality is I'm not a very good listener either. Really not. My listening skills are pretty poor. And I do know that, and I have been working on it better. I'm, I'm absolutely, they're really bad if I'm talking on the telephone because you can't see the person and you, so you can't see facial expressions, but there's everything else going on around you in the room that you're at and so it's hard for me to really focus on listening to people when I'm on the phone. Sometimes it's hard to listen to people because I already know what they're going to say. I know what they think. I know what they're feeling. And since I already know, I don't really have to listen. I can, I just, the words just kind of go in and go out. And it's kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, you know, like that. So I, I don't listen very well. Sometimes I don't listen well because I'm formulating this brilliant response while they're still talking. And so I'm more focused on what I'm going to say back than what they're actually saying. And so as soon as they're done talking or sometimes before they're done talking, I blurt out this great, brilliant response that I have put together, which is really embarrassing when after you say it, you realize that that response didn't have anything to do with what they actually said. So I try to get better at listening. And this is a problem, and I think it's a problem for guys where we don't listen because we're trying to fix things. If you go to a marriage conference, they talk about this a lot. It's a, evidently a big enough problem. And I do know that Dory has on one or many, many more occasions told me, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. Have any of you guys ever heard that? A couple of you have? Okay. Others, your wife just hasn't said it. Okay. But she means. So I'm not a very good listener. Well, this lesson today isn't about how we need to be good listeners. We're going to be looking at Jesus' ears, kind of like we looked at his eyes last week. And last week, when I got to the end of my lesson, and I'm kind of putting together how to wrap it all up, my normal instinct is just to go into how we need to have eyes like Jesus does. And we need to see things the way Jesus sees things. But as I was writing it, and, and I got to that point where I'm kind of putting that together, I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Most of our lessons have to do with how we need to change the way we do things how we need to be a different way and get rid of this and put this on. And, and it dawned on me, it's been a long time since we've just looked at Jesus. And that's why at the end of the lesson last week, there wasn't a challenge to you to develop eyes like Jesus. There was just a reminder to you that he sees us. He sees what you're going through. And he responds to what he sees in your life today the same way he responded to what he saw back in the New Testament. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at Jesus' ears. Again, we can't look at his uh, physical description of his ears because we don't know what his ears look like. Now, this morning, I went and 
I had to get something out of that very back room on the west side of the building back there. And if you go in there, there's actually two pictures of Jesus. You can go in there and look and see what he what he looked like. Uh, but we don't really know what his ears looked like. But we do know what he heard and how he responded to that. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Because have you ever wondered, is Jesus listening? Have you ever uh, prayed and prayed about something and nothing happened and you just wonder, is he really listening? Have you ever wondered if the words of your prayers are really getting the point across? Or are you miscommunicating with him? Have you ever wondered if he really feels what you're trying to express to him? So this morning we're going to be addressing some of those questions. And the first thing that I want us to notice is... That Jesus hears the news, but he also hears what God has planned. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17, we read, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and he lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now you would think that when Jesus heard that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been put into prison, that Jesus would have done something. I mean, he's Jesus. He can go up there. He can speak a word. The prison doors open up. He could have sent disciples to, to feed John and care for John until he got him released from prison. He could have done any of those things, but he doesn't. He leaves and he goes someplace different, and he starts preaching. Because Jesus heard the situation, but he also heard and understood that God had something better planned. In John chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, we read the story now. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Everybody wanted Jesus to come to Lazarus. To healing. They had seen him heal people before. Mary and Martha sent word so that he would come. His disciples wanted him to come. And Jesus says, we're not going. Because even though Jesus heard what was taking place, he also heard the plan of God and he knew that God's plan was greater than just the wants and the needs of the people. In Luke 8, we read, a, we read this story last week of Jairus the synagogue ruler coming to Jesus because his daughter was dying. And while they're going to Jairus' house, uh, they kind of get interrupted on the way by the woman with the bleeding issue. And, and then when they start back along the way, some people from Jairus' house come to him and tell him, your daughter's already gone. You don't need to bother the, the rabbi anymore. But look at verse 50 here. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. You see, church, when we go to Jesus, we trust that he hears us. We trust that he can do what we're asking of him. We trust that he's got things in the palm of his hand, but we also need to understand that not only does he hear what we need, he also hears the plan of God. And so all of our prayers may not be answered the way that we expect them to, but we trust that God is still in control. Amen? We also learn from the New Testament that Jesus hears the words, but he also hears the heart. 
In Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 21, we read, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All of these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. You know, everything looks good. Jesus tells him this is what you need to do to inherit eternal life. The guy says, I've done all of that. I'm good. His words express the fact that he's in good standing with God. And then we come to verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. See, Jesus heard the word. But he also knew that there was something in this guy's heart that his words did not truly convey. Which is kind of a scary thing sometimes because there are things that we would like to hide from God. But Jesus can hear them all. Like we see in, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and through 12. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus heard the words of the Pharisees, but he also heard the heart problems that they had. And his answer did not, you know, he didn't explain why he was there as the way that they wanted it. What he did was he addressed the heart problems that they were having themselves. Sometimes when Jesus sees the heart, it's not that he always sees the, the bad stuff that we don't express to him. Sometimes we notice that he actually sees the deep, true faith that we have that we might not even be able to put into words. Like we see... Uh, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. No, okay, I'm going to read the first part of this, and then we'll get to what's on the slide up here. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And then we come to verse 10 that's up on the screen. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And the rest of the text says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out into darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you believe it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Church, we know that Jesus hears our words. But we also know that he hears our hearts. He hears the things we're trying to hide from him. But he also hears the deep faith that we have that sometimes we can't even put into words. There is no miscommunication with Jesus because he knows everything that we say. And then there's another thing that we want to know. Does what he hears really touch his heart? Does he feel what we're experiencing, what we're saying? And we'll look at a couple of passages to, to see this. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 6 through 12, we read the following account. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed 
But because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted, and he had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. And the next line is very telling. In chapter 14, verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. You know, we read earlier, when Jesus heard that he was in prison, he could have gone and saved him, but he didn't because he knew God had a bigger plan. But even knowing what the outcome of that plan was going to be, when Jesus heard that John was beheaded, it touched his heart. It struck him so that he had to withdraw and be by himself for a little while. In John chapter 9, we read the story of the man born blind. I encourage you to read it. It's an absolutely cool, fascinating, almost comical story. Jesus heals this guy, and then there's this great debate that arises among the people. They're arguing first about whether or not this guy was actually the one born blind. Then they start arguing about who was it that healed him, and then they start arguing about, well, who is this Jesus really? And like I say, it's almost a, a comical story. But the Pharisees are questioning everybody. They question the man, they question his parents, and they question the man again. And then at the end of it, they're asking this guy, well, who do you think he is? And the man says, well, he's, I don't know for sure who he is, but I know that he was sent from God. And boy, that makes the Pharisees mad because they're trying to convince everybody that Jesus was not sent from God. And here this guy says, I had, look, I know he was sent from God. And they get so frustrated with him, they kick him out. I don't know what they kick him out of because it doesn't really tell us. And, and you know, my first thought was well, they kicked him out of the synagogue, but they weren't in the synagogue. Basically, what I know they did by kicking him out is they disfellowshipped him in some way, shape, or form. But look at John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And what's interesting in this are the words, but when he found him. Which means that when Jesus heard that they had kicked him out, Jesus went looking for the guy. It touched his heart to know that this guy had now been excluded. And Jesus goes and finds him to bring him back in into the truth about the Son of Man. So we learn when we look at Jesus, when we look at his ears, we learn these three things. First of all, we learn that when we ask, he may not immediately respond because he hears, because God may have something bigger going on. Church, there's so many of us who have asked God for something. We've asked, we've begged, we've pleaded, and our prayers seem to go unanswered. But we can always trust that, yes, he does hear, but he also knows that God has something and that's more important than just what we want. But we know that he hears. The next thing is when we go to him, we know he knows what we even don't say. There is no miscommunication with Jesus. When we go to him and talk, we may not know the words to say. We may not know how to put it into words very well. But he hears. Because he doesn't just hear our words, he hears our hearts. Two things about that. Number one, we can't hide anything from him. We can't lie to him. We can't tell him uh, something that isn't true and expect him to believe it. But the other thing is, when we say to him, when we come to him and talk to him, even if we can't express with words what we want to say, he knows. And he knows our faith. And then lastly, when he hears, it does touch his heart. He is not some emotionless, mindless God. He loves us. He loves you. And when you speak to him and when you go to him, he hears your hurts and they, they touch his heart. He hears your joy and it touches his heart. Everything we bring to him touches 